Um, so uh, I, our next speaker is Naveed Kansari. I met Naveed about three years ago over drinks when I was a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. Um, we shared a deep but uh, very conflicted love of video games and we confronted one of our favorite and I guess controversial issues, racial diversity at the annual DICE conference in Las Vegas. Um, the former director of production for Rockstar Games, Naveed led his cinematic talents to games like Alan Wake and now runs Ink Stories. He also has this crazy, amazing idea presently in development for a game called 1979, a game set during the Iran hostage crisis. Uh, please welcome Naveed Kansari to the stage. Hello, everybody. Let me figure out how this works. All right. So, let's get right to it. Let me put this bottle down. I'm not much for podiums. This looks a lot more intimidating on TV. This feels a lot better out here. So, educate or entertain. What's the focus of making a game? And are these two exclusive of one another? I don't think so. But I think that one could learn from another. So what's the main goals of making a game for change? And these are just my opinions of what I think you know, are the main things that you want to achieve. You want to educate. One way or another, you want people to learn something, whether it's a language, whether it's changing a cultural habit. You want people to be educated with the game that you're making. Two, you want to create some kind of a social impact. You want to create a change. A change that's taking place in the pattern that these gamers are you know, using, and you want to see if you can have a social impact towards that. And that then leads us to increase awareness. You want to make sure that this message gets out to as many people as possible. And you want to make sure that it spreads out. So that's game for change. Now let's talk about commercial games. What's their main focus? They want to entertain. This is the major difference between these two sectors, educate and entertain. The other one is they want to have a social impact. Sounds pretty similar, but their social impact is actually about appealing to the masses. What they want to do is have a footprint in pop culture. And finally, they want to increase awareness. But their version of increasing awareness is selling tons of copies, creating a brand, and making sure that that brand goes on to becoming a franchise. So are these two actually that different? I think it's not a matter of being different, it's a matter of how you're prioritizing it and how one can learn from the other. So, a little background on myself. As you can see from the titles above, I only have worked in the AAA commercial world. I've worked on not only first-person shooters, but I've also worked on Grand Theft Auto, open world, sandbox kind of games. And the main goal, the main objective here has always been to entertain entertain, entertain, sell more copies, and get it out there. And I think, you know, when you look at Grand Theft Auto San Andreas selling 22 million copies, the word is kind of getting out. So my question to you is this. How many of you think Grand Theft Auto is an educational game or a game for change? All right. Three isn't bad. That's, I could work with that. So let me uh, give you a quick little story uh, about myself. I was brought up in Iran. Uh, my family left after the Iranian Revolution, and we made our way to Canada. And then I made my way down to New York. And about six years ago, I went back to Iran for the first time. And uh, I traveled the entire country, from the, uh, from the borders of Iraq to Afghanistan, down towards the Persian Gulf, and finally up towards the north, where I came across this small village called Gombad. And in Gombad, I was uh, approached by all these young men and women who had played Grand Theft Auto, and seeing that I'm the only Iranian that's credited on it, they just kind of flocked to me. And this village has maybe three TVs, two PCs, and that's it. And they were playing their GTAs on their PCs. And, you know, they approached me, and they were extremely kind and affectionate, and, uh, you know, they were uh, you know, asking me, so, hey, look, I'm kind of stuck in this stage. I can't get past this. What, what's the, you know, can you help me out? And, Eventually, our conversations led to this one young man who said, you know, America must be a pretty amazing country if they allow you to make Grand Theft Auto, where you can drive around in your car, listen to music, open up your door, and walk around and run around and do whatever you want. And at that point, I was, you know, kind of took it in, and it, and it really didn't sink in until, you know, when I returned, and I realized that, in a weird way, Grand Theft Auto was passively educating these guys about freedom, 
choices, you know, the right to do what you want to do, democracy perhaps. Now, I know that sounds all pretty heavy-handed, but th there is some parts of this that they were passively learning. So I started thinking about my good friend Mike. Now, Mike is the man. He's actually, I gotta read this, he's a conversation conductor. And if any of you know what that is, please come to me after, because I still haven't figured out what the hell that means. But what Mike says is very, very interesting. Find an educational experience within the game. Not education on top, around, and about the game. The game itself should not be the education. So that's really the thrust of what my goals have been in the recent past and with what I'm trying to do with 1979, which I'm going to talk to you about a little bit later. So I personally believe that these two divisions, Games for Change and commercial games, can actually come together and the time is now. The next evolution of games is right now. And it's taking place not on the consoles. In my opinion, it's taking place on the tablets. The tablets are growing at an exponential rate. They're cannibalizing the console market. And more importantly, more people are playing ga games on the tablet than any other time before. And it's introducing huge new pe populations, gender, cultural, religious backgrounds onto these games. 84% of people that play on the, 84% of people that have a tablet are playing games on their tablet. So, what can we learn from one another? Well, I think that you cannot deny the fact that commercial games have a great way of getting their message across. We might not like all their messages, but it's getting to the four corners of the world. It's getting in Iran in a small town like Gombad, where they barely have enough basic facilities like medicine, electricity, and so forth to run that village, but people are playing Grand Theft Auto and they're finishing it. They're going through the whole gamut and they're going back and getting the next copy. On the flip side, what have commercial games been continually criticized for, aside from the violence and everything else? What's the main thing, in terms of from the gamer's perspective, in terms of from the audience's perspective? It's weak content. The stories lack depth. Well, guess what? Games for Change, that's the greatest strength you have. It's great stories. It's true stories. It's personal stories. And you need to be able to do this. You need to knock down the door with entertainment, and then you need to come in with education. And that's the best combination for it. And that's what we're trying to do at Ink Stories with 1979. Historical fiction mixed with cultural navigation. If you understand the personal stories of people during, while you're playing a game, and you understand what are cultural nuances that you might not be familiar with, you're going to be able to navigate that game better. So as a result, you're going to wind up getting greater rewards from it. But you're also going to be able to learn about what's taking place. You don't feel like that's the main objective. You're basically playing this game. And in order to succeed in this game, what you're actually le you're slowly, slowly learning about what it's like to be Muslim, what it's like to be a woman that's forced to have to cover themselves in Iran, what it's like to actually be forced to hide from social police, what it's like to actually you know, say a few lines in Farsi, which I think I just said. But these are all the things that we slowly learn in order to achieve, in order to get further down that map and to get further into that game. By doing that, we're actually learning something. So let's talk about 1979. 1979 is a third-person action-adventure game that takes place during the uh, period after the revolution and before the Iraq war. Of course, key to all this is it's during the hostage crisis. You wind up, historically true, with Operation Eagle Claw landing in the desert, and unlike a lot of other games where after the mission's been aborted and you're left back and you're like, oh, fuck it, I'm gonna go to Tehran and I'm gonna free those hostages all by myself, it's the exact opposite, it's reality. You've been abandoned, the missions have been aborted, you're in a country which is hostile towards you, or at least that's what you think. You wanna get out. You wanna get out of that country, you wanna save your ass. So you head towards Iraq. As you head towards Iraq, you come a lot of, amongst a number of different experiences, which teaches you about that world, which teaches you about that culture, and teaches you about that time, and teaches you about the oppression that's taking place, and what's taking place within that country. I think a lot of people, looking back at this period, look at 1979, look at Iran at that time, and say, hey, Khomeini comes into power, this is a theocratic nation, it's all about Islam, and they don't like anything else. Whereas if you actually take a look at that time, we are talking about a lot of political parties that existed in this country that were opposed to Khomeini. They came together to overthrow the Shah, 
And now they've got Khomeini in power, and Khomeini is going by and eliminating every one of their opposition, every one of his opposition. Which leads me, you go to come to go into Iraq, and assassination attempts made on the deputy minister. And so all the Iranian exiles, as was done, and with the Iraq, Iran-Iraq war coming up, are forced back into Iran. So that's not working. You go up to the north, the Kurds will sneak you through to Turkey. That doesn't work because, as happened, Khomeini calls a jihad on his own people. He calls it on the Kurds. And as a result, the Kurds wind up having a huge battle with the Iranian military at that time. Eventually, the story winds up getting, as you're helping the Kurds with their, with their plans, you get arrested. It takes you to Tehran. And in Tehran, you're imprisoned. But when you escape from the prison, you come across these different parties, the Communist Party, the Mujahideen Party, all of these different political affiliations that want the Americans out of the country. Why? Why would they side with you? They want, quite simple, they want to side with you because if they can get the Americans out, the country can focus on itself. If there is no great Satan, we can domestically address the issues that we have. And of course, Khomeini knows this and goes about eliminating, as he does, all of these parties over the next six months. The game continues on in a number of different ways, and that's the main narrative and the main focus of 1979. And as I said, this game is strictly being made for the tablet. What's interesting is that I don't want to give you just one experience, and I don't believe that what people are doing with tablets right now with the in-game purchases is, has real value. You want to provide real value. And what's real value, in my opinion, and why am I up here? It's about experience. It's about giving people the stories, about that personal experience. Because if you give somebody a personal experience and they don't like it, they just learn something from it. They learn that they don't like it, and they learn what it is that they don't like. So I want to give you characters. I'm spending all this time building these characters to create this story. I want to give you different experiences. I want you to be that female student who's covered up now in her chador and is trying to get from one end of the city to the other end of the city and is continually being, has to look out for the social police. For those of you who might not be familiar, the social police run around in Iran and basically check on women to make sure that they're covered in their veil and don't have any makeup on. That in itself is four missions that we're going to find on giving to you. We're also going to give you different kind of characters. You're going to be able to play as a member of the Mujahideen party. You're going to be able to play as an Islamic cleric. You're going to be able to play as a, a young girl who is actually homeless and is trying to make a living for herself in Tehran. All of these different experiences that come together are going to be able to fulfill a much larger story. I don't have the capacity with a tablet to do what you do on a console. I don't have the budget. Cost, you know, last game I worked on, it cost $50 million. I don't have that budget. But what I do have is the ability to try to replicate that open world experience. So what I do is I'm going to do it with a narrative, and then I'm going to give it to you with a number of different characters that you're going to be able to experience and their different journeys, and you're going to learn from all this. And then on top of that, I'm going to give you mini games. From the good folks who I played tons of Nintendo games, WarioWare's in particular, it was just inundated with mini games, and you didn't know what the rules were. And that's actually what it should be. If you go to a country, if you go to a place where you don't know the rules, like Chris was talking about when he was in Japan, if you go and you don't know what those rules are, you have to learn, and you have to learn through trial, trial and error. So, for example, what we were going to do is we're going to take on the different hardware capabilities of a tablet. We're going to use the camera. And what's going to happen is when that car gets that red beam around it and you see the social police comes out, the game turns off, the camera comes on, and you see yourself with that mask, right, with the makeup on. And a clock is in the corner. And if you don't do anything because you're like, what the hell am I supposed to do here? You get arrested. And that's how you learned your first lesson. You go back and you do the same thing, and you rub your finger, and you realize that you can remove the makeup. And if you remove all of it within time, you've achieved your goal. It's a small mini game. It doesn't mean anything. And in most, of, in most of this app world, it's just a free throwaway. But if you put these experiences, accumulative, on top of a narrative, you're giving them not only entertainment, but you're giving them an amazing educational experience. And there's other things that I could definitely go on to, but the only other thing I want to point out that I think really resonates is the voice recognition. You walk up to a door, you knock on a door. Phonetically, a line comes out in Farsi. If you don't pronounce it correctly, the door doesn't open. You, not, you might not have a lot of Farsi by the end of, you know, in terms of like, you might not be able to go to Iran and just start chatting it up with Ahmadinejad, but 
I'm pretty sure just those few lines, again, is breaking those barriers of you feeling that you're a little bit more familiar with that culture. And in the end, it's all about that. It's about breaking down these barriers. It's about getting to know what it's like on the other side. And from education, from what took place in 1979, I'm playing that game now, maybe that'll make me think differently as Iran and the United States or, in this or Iran and the world is in this continual conversation and turmoil about an impeding war. So maybe that's the education that's going to come through this experience. Now, why 1979? My personal belief is that there is a huge demand by people out there to no longer play these games in these pseudo worlds. The stories that resonate with us, like when I think of the uh, Vietnam War, I don't know, I've never read a book about the Vietnam War, but I've watched Apocalypse Now, I've watched Platoon. These movies have shaped my opinion of what Vietnam was like. And I'll tell you, it's, it, it seemed like a horrible war. Civilian casualties, military casualty, th you know, people unhappy in this country domestically about what's taking place. Those are the themes that kind of came back to me. And I think that those are pretty much the themes that kind of, is what you would get out of most journals and most educational pamphlets that would, in regards to this time period. So 1979, as you can just see from the fact that we've just discussed this topic, is already resonating with like mainstream media, CNN, PlayStation. They've picked it up because they know we want these kinds of games. I don't want to play a Call of Duty where I go into a pseudo Afghanistan and I wipe out a whole bunch of people. That's fine. I like you know, I, I, it's a form of entertainment and it's its own niche, but it doesn't have to be the only niche. And what I'm proposing is let's bring together these elements of Games for Change where we're actually being conscious about the stories that we're telling, but let's be honest about why we want to tell these stories. What's better, the, the truth, the based on these experiences of people in these places, in these different countries, isn't that going to resonate a lot more with me while I'm playing that game rather than something that's kind of made up? That, you know, I think, is the perfect marriage of those two. So distribute, get your arms out there, get it out there via the commercial world and how they do it. We can learn from the commercial world. They don't sell 22 million copies just because people like to go around and shoot things. They've had a way of penetrating the mass people, mass media, or not media, but the mass psyche. And that's what we need to do with Games for Change. And in conclusion, I want you to know that 1979 is just the beginning of what we're planning on doing. We're planning on hitting El Salvador in 82, Panama in 88, and Liberia in 92, and 95 with Bosnia. And all of these are based on people's stories. These are based on people's personal experiences that we're gonna put. So history comes together with entertainment, comes together with education to create what's gonna be the next generation, the next evolution of games, which is gonna be embraced by these huge masses of players that are playing on the tablet. Thank you very much. Oh, great. No, you can, do, you can stand over there. No, you come on just, over like, here. Throw. Come on. We've all, we've all shared it's the It's scary out here. here. I have, you know, the podium makes it a lot easier. It looks scary on TV because you can't see if you guys, but it's all black here. It's just kind of freaky. But, uh. um, so my first question, and I'm sure this is one that folks in this audience have, is about violence. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm sure for most folks, they don't see any place in, you know, any kind of cause-based game for the role of violence, any situation where you can kill people. I was wondering, what's your personal justification for how violence should or perhaps should not be used in a game like 19, 1979? Um, well, I can tell you that, just before I jump onto the larger, 1979 has actually no uh, shooting elements to it. So, but everything is... And, and that comes from, and to be totally honest with you, that comes from two worlds. One is, as a result, I don't really think shooter games work well on the tablet. That's one. And the other one is that I believe that if you're in a, to be true to the story, if I'm in a country that is somewhat, you know, hostile because I'm an American and I'm trying to get my way out of there, I'm not going to get a gun and try to shoot people. I'm going to try to be, you know, stealth-like. I'm going to be trying to be conspicuous. So it's all about actually hand-to-hand -hand combat. In regards to violence, I mean, I think that this is a continue. This this is something that I continually, you know, people ask me questions about, and I think violence exists in our world, and as a result, I don't think it should be glorified, but I think it should also be acknowledged, and I think that in the end, the responsibility of who's playing those games comes to the people who are purchasing that game, and you know, I can't deny the fact that I didn't play violent games when I was a kid. 
Um, did that mess me up? Probably, you know, uh, but, uh, uh, but here I am talking to Games for Change, so it can't be that bad. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's there. I think it's going to be there. I think it's, it's, it's foolish to not recognize that a big chunk of the market is attracted to playing games like this. The reason Black Ops has sold as many as it is isn't because you get to walk up and shake hands with an Afghanistani person and be like, hey, yo, what's up? I mean, it's I more like $60 pain, huh? just, just for that. Yeah. <laughs> so that, and, and that's it. So I, but, but I do believe that what's taking place now is that, and what, what really as a result of what's come about in the mobile world, is that it's not the only game. And it's not the only equation for success. And I think that as more and more people are playing, the, it's diluting the, the numbers of people who are attracted by first-person shooters and killing. Kicking ass. Sure. Um, so you think about Upton Sinclair in the 20s with the jungle and he was a professional writer. Mm -hmm. He exposed the fictional story, yeah. but he exposed a lot of um, the terrible things that were happening in the meat packaging industry or a director like Davis Guggenheim who worked on shows like Deadwood and the Inconvenient Truth. You see this crossover in other mediums between professionals who've established themselves in one world and a desire to do something for the greater good. You don't see that as much for games. Why don't you think more folks, you know, with your background and your kind of AAA pedigree, try to do something like 1979? Why do you think they're stuck in the same? Why don't they ever leave? Well, I mean, I think part of it is. I mean, I, I was I've, I've been fortunate enough that I actually left games and went on to make a couple of documentaries. And my wife's here. I actually kind of met her through that. So hi, baby, wherever you are. Um, but. I think the big reason is, and I think the reason I worked at Rockstar for a long time that I did, was that they focus actually on the story. And that necessarily hasn't been a priority amongst a lot of the AAA developers. It hasn't been about the story. It's, and you know, kind of like how I was talking about entertainment and education, their focus has been on gameplay and then story has kind of fallen you know, second place. So I believe that part of it has been that we haven't really nurtured and try to tell people that you can actually write really, really great games that don't necessarily have to embrace that. So, and I think that there's not as many people because most of the people are coming up from schooling and education that's just strictly focused on gaming. And then when they go outside to Hollywood to try to get writers, they're getting the kind of the same mix, but somebody who, you have to understand the media. You have to understand how gaming works from the inside in order to be able to change it. And of course, we all know it's a pretty young you know, business. So as a result, it's the people that are on the inside have, have yet to mature, and we've yet to actually mature young people to go down that path and tell stories that are more in depth. Um, sports writer Buzz Bissinger makes a very similar argument about professional athletes that they don't, they aren't, they don't become well-rounded, they don't take interest in other things outside of sports, and that's why they don't start foundations to cause-based things. Do we have any questions in the audience? I can keep talking, but if anybody has any questions, Come on, don't be scared. Anyone? There we go. We got one right there. So you talked a lot about how um, sports games and education are changing in the world. Do you know what it is to marketplace or place that doesn't change the world? How would that change the world in your life? Well, I mean, to be honest with you, games would change would be a bit. Uh, would be one <laughs> way. I, I think, I think a, bit, a big, um, I think you have, it, it's all also about kind of like, Inventing this new this new platform, you know, it, it's 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 about embracing what are the themes in the commercial world and looking at the strengths of the education world and how can you bring these things together and what is your actual objective? Is your edu is your main objective to educate, or is it to entertain? That's that that that's really at, at the crutch of you know not only my talk but at the crutch of where the, our differences lie. Can you educate and use that as the primary focus, or can you entertain and then use that as a way? And if you want to go down the entertainment path, I think you're going to be able to find larger partners, out, or not larger, but more partners out there for you to be able to approach. Because in the end, the guys who are making games, they want to make games. They, they want to make things that are going to entertain you. If they can educate you on the side, that's a bonus for them. They're going to take that on. But you, they, they're two different camps. But what we can do is bring these camps together to fulfill the needs of those who want to entertain and to fulfill those who want to educate as long as we understand what the objective of the camps are. Question right here in front. Hi. Hmm. 
Yeah, a big focus for, for 1979, um, you know, I come back from you know, doing the, the cinematic stuff, so motion capture, you know, facial capture, all that heavy duty stuff. We're actually peeling it back. Our goal is to have all our cinematics, all our story aspects told to you in a graphic novel. For any of you who are interested, it, it, this is not my project or the product. There's a com uh, company called Cognito Comics. They've done a great comic book online called Operation Ajax, which takes place about the 1952 um, overthrowing of the uh, of uh, Mossadegh by the CIA in the United States. It's an amazing interactive graphic novel. It's got a number of CIA dossiers that have been opened up. It's got like bios of actual characters. So our goal is release the game, have the in-game monetization through the characters, and then also continually update the game every quarter by providing new characters, new experiences. And then alongside, we're gonna have eight graphic novels. Each novel follows the story of one individual using some of the material from the game and then a larger graphic novel that brings the whole story together and putting, creating you know, kind of like a comic book wiki page of everything that took place during the year 1979. Because I, if, funny enough, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who was like, oh yeah, you know, my, my son wants to do an essay on the Iran hostage crisis and he just went online. And I kind of was like, wow, when I was a kid, you know, open up that Encyclopedia Britannica, it was about this big, and you know, you rifle through it, and then you go to another source, and it's all here. So we always like, well, this would be a great opportunity to also create these stories, and then have it actually based in truth. And then the game itself is gonna have all these actual documents. We're gonna have news footage right within the game. So I don't know if anybody's played Uncharted or any of these games where you can walk around and you see a treasure. You can do the same thing, you'll hit something, and an actual video footage will be like, and I don't know if everybody recalls, but nights, when the hostage crisis took place, that's what kicked off ABC's coverage on a daily basis. Every night at news time, we'd be like, this is what's taking place. So we're gonna be able to use that stuff and embed it in. You're not paying for the game. What you will play, pay for is the extra characters, and you'll pay for the graphic novels. So those would be we're, we're just uh, out of time. I do have one quick question for you. Are sure. you worried at all about Apple in terms of, you know, this? has potential maybe in some quarters to be controversial and? I mean, I think it does, have, it, 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 it does but I, I feel like they've kind of um, seem to be a company that, as, as long as I'm not being, I don't want to say the word, as long as I'm not, just not being exploited about the actual material and the fact that I feel, I mean, I feel like I'm actually kind of taking, a, it's, a, it's a documentary that I'm making into a video game. So there's going to be a lot of stuff there backing up, but you know, you never know. I mean, Apple could come back and tell us, to, you know, no, and then we'll figure. Out. Microsoft just announced that they've got a new tablet, so maybe we'll, we'll, we'll talk to those guys. <laughs> the stars, I mean, those well. Apple people are horrible. So let's hang out together. <laughs> um, everyone, please give uh, a warm hand to. Thank you very much.